Excellencies, distinguished representatives of the diplomatic corps and international organizations, businesses and academia, professors, fellows, citizens, and ladies and gentlemen. It is my distinct pleasure to open this opening plenary on Global Engagement and Empowerment Forum on Sustainable Development. In 2015, in a, at the United Nations, Sustainable Development Goals was agreed by world leaders, and it, it was a historic achievement. And today, we are very fortunate to have with us two leaders who played instrumental role in engineering that agreement. We have with us the then Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And we also have the then President of Austria, who led Austrian delegation to the United Nations, Dr. Heinz Fischer. Please welcome him with a big applause. And two leaders, then after their respective retirement in 2016, they decided to join hands in continuing their contribution for the implementation of Sustainable Development Goals, and they established the Ban Ki-moon Center in Vienna January this year. But six months earlier, uh, Yonsei University established sister Ban Ki-moon Center for Sustainable Development here at Yonsei campus. So we are also grateful to the president of Yonsei University and uh, faculty members for that. SDG is a historic achievement to succeed Millennium Development Goals. Millennium Development Goals was agreed upon in 2000, and it was implemented for the next 15 years. But the job was not completely done. That's why Sustainable Development Goals was agreed upon to succeed MDG, but expanded. MDG was mostly focused on anti-poverty, education, and health. But Sustainable Development Goals are covering all aspects of human life, be it social, economic, environmental, and even political. So implementation of MDG is a huge challenge. And today, we will start uh, our session by listening to uh, the uh, Mr. Mocharski, who is the CEO of uh, Marsh and McLennan companies, who have done uh, its uh, risk analysis about the global risk landscape for the last 13 years for the Davos Forum. So I will invite Alexander Mocharski to come up to the stage. And we'll hear from him how his global risk analysis relates to the SDG and why it is relevant in our discussion today. So, Mr. Mochaski, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, two leaders, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. At the end of the 20th century, there was an assumption that greater economic interdependence amongst countries would ensure peace and stability well into the new century. The global economic and political context today suggests that assumption was incorrect. Geostrategic tensions have re-emerged on multiple fronts with wide-ranging political, economic, and social consequences. For many countries, this tension is resulting in policy implementation which focuses on protecting short-term national interests while limiting broader obligations. In the context of sustainable development and inclusive growth, such policies are often fragmented, biased, or uninformed. A collective effort is required by the global, global community, particularly governments, civil society, and the private sector to ensure that we work together to put long-term collective development ahead of short-termism. However, while this group holds the keys to ensuring we achieve the sustainable development goals 
Their incompleteness also exposes the SDGs to an increasingly complex risk landscape. In this context, there are two broad challenges for leaders across the public and private sector that I will aim to cover today. First, are we properly appreciating the new risk environment? What are the emerging threats that might surprise us and hinder our ability to support sustainable development for all? Second, what does resilience for these risks look like? And how can we sensibly prepare our organizations to achieve it? Let's start with some good news. Across markets, the global economy is growing. And it seems we are leaving the specter of the global financial crisis behind. The IMF has revised the global growth figures upward from 3.7 to 3.9 percent for 2018-19. Business confidence is strong in many countries. Asia continues to be the global growth engine, with emerging and developing Asia expected to grow at around 6.5 percent for 2018-2019 roughly the same as 2017. The region continues to account for over half of global growth. As Christine Lagarde has remarked in Davos, this is also a good time for a government to repair the roof while the sun is shining and address any structural weaknesses in their economies. But looking beyond the good news, I think it's important we always remind ourselves that the context of global recovery and growth has been and will continue to change at an extraordinary pace. It's this pace of change that is shaping the global risk environment. Not only are there fast forces of change connecting and intersecting in increasingly unexpected ways with complex reverberations, they have raised questions about the overstretching of existing norms and the possibility in some areas of runway collapse or the transition to a new suboptimal status quo. Consider, for example, how social media as a technology has brought us closer together by negating physical distance, while at the same time driving a wedge in communities by creating echo chambers, exacerbating social polarization. Organizations have realized that we are facing fundamentally a new risk environment characterized by emerging and interconnecting threats rather than well-known standalone ones. This graph describes the global risk landscape in terms of likelihood and impact. As evaluated by nearly a thousand risk experts in the World Economic Forum's annual Global Risk Perception Survey, a couple of observations here. Environmental threats retain their paramount position in the minds of risk experts with extreme weather and natural catastrophes topping the chart in likelihood as well as scoring high in impact. 2017 saw a rise in the importance of cyber threats, and they are definitely here to stay. There is a clear cluster of high and medium likelihood and impact geopolitical and societal risks. Weapons of mass destruction has moved up significantly in likelihood and quite obviously out of concerns linked to North Korea. Let's focus on the top right-hand corner where environmental risks dominate. As you can see, extreme weather and natural catastrophes occupy the top of the chart. What is also notable is the presence of climate change response failure. This risk was significantly amplified during 2017 with the withdrawal of the US from the Paris Climate Accord. I'd also like to highlight the two red dots that are among the top risks in terms of likelihood and impact. Through these risks, we can draw a clear link between environmental risk and pertinent societal risks. Firstly, Asia is expected to be firmly within the crosshairs of water crises of the future, with 88%, 88% of the region's population impacted by water shortages by 2050. The crisis can be argued to originate from a combination of climate change, extreme weather events, and poor urban planning. We also think about what has been termed climate refugees, people that are displaced by extreme events which rob them of their livelihood and force them to uproot and move to other areas. For governments, but also businesses and other organizations, the priority right now for environmental concerns is focused on three major areas. Natural catastrophe management, the assessment of vulnerability to extreme weather events, is particularly important due to the large human and economic costs that these events entail. Pollution reduction. 
This is a priority for government, not only in China, where this problem has been very serious, but also for other governments in the region. Low carbon transition. Tying to the previous points, we are seeing a momentous shift to a low carbon economy. Again, China has been the leader in the region in promoting renewable energy, which has become a priority for many countries. Renewable infrastructure projects are being developed across the region and are receiving ample support from government initiatives. There is also a shift in investment sentiment towards low carbon assets, and there has been a substantial rise in green finance instruments such as green bonds. Let's talk about cyber next. Again, there are three observations here. The loss from cyber attacks and cyber breaches is substantial. The cost of cyber crime to businesses may amount to $8 trillion over the next five years. This trend is perhaps inevitable as the number of interconnected devices in the world is expected to double between now and 2020, thereby increasing the access points for malware. But marked escalation in large cyber attacks is worrying. To put things in con into context, Lloyd's, have calculated that the takedown of a single cloud provider could cause as much economic loss as Hurricane Katrina. Enormous industrial transformations have resulted in market disruptions and subsequent shifts in market power. Consider, for example, the concentration and social risks arising from the growing power of the biggest tech companies. The largest technology giants are between them spending $50 billion a year in R&D, commandeering a lot of specialist AI talent, amassing colossal amounts of data, and making radical plays in sectors from automotive to healthcare to financial services. A new political dynamic, technological prowess is seen by both superpowers as a means of future competitive advantage in terms of both economic supremacy and national security. This has led to two things. First, high levels of concern about foreign providers of technology and critical infrastructure, Secondly, increased geopolitical tensions as a result of purported instances of state-sponsored, ever more sophisticated cyber attacks. The point on geotechnological concerns gives us a nice segue into talking about the increasing complex geopolitical relations in the region. Globally, major democracies have been hit with waves of populist, nationalist pressures. We can think about the US 2006 election, Brexit, the Catalonia crisis in Spain and the Philippines if we are to think closer to home. More intense identity politics and greater attempts by political leaders to consolidate executive power may increase the likelihood of backlashes by populations disappointed in the ability of governments to deliver promised benefits. Second, the world's largest powers appear to be on maneuvers. The US shifting objectives and style Russia regaining former ground in, in gaining ground in former areas of influence, and China intensifying strategic goals. The resultant vacuums and collisions are both stirring the larger regional powers to a bolder action and also arousing the concern of smaller states who fear that they may be squeezed by the moving of these tectonic plates and have fewer opportunities to pivot and hedge than not so long ago. Third, the geopolitical threat landscape is multifaceted. At one end of the spectrum, we have a real risk of deployment of nuclear weapons. I believe here in Korea, this is acutely felt. At the other, a raft of economic protectionist measures being implemented in a largely ad hoc fashion. And in between, proxy conflicts in third party states, cyber engagements, propaganda and disinformation ventures, what we call piloted chaos in one nice turn of phrase. Finally, Let's turn to the positive global economic growth story again. The headline numbers have, been op have often masked underlying fragilities. In the current global landscape, let me talk about four worrying trends. First, the influence of politics and protectionism. The rise in net harmful trade actions by G20 countries is an easy indicator, but probably the less interesting part of the story. More interesting, is the less well aggregated volume of corporate bailouts and state subsidies, investment constraints, and workforce migration restrictions, and by local imperatives. Also of note here are the fraught attempts to renegotiate major trade agreements. 
Second, debt. Global debt has risen to a record $233 trillion, more than three times global annual economic output, with the growth of debt in China in recent years a particular concern. Persistently low commodity prices continue to challenge the fiscal situation of key exporter countries. Third, high asset prices. Markets have continued to rise over the last year, after a bit of a bump just now. Accordingly to one cyclically adjusted price earnings index, stocks have only twice before been as high as they are now, in 1929, not a good year, and 2000. The World Bank has recently warned about the possible consequences of sharply higher interest rates that could be triggered by better than expected growth. And fourth, inequality and financial insecurity. Stock markets may have risen and the global economy may be growing, but real wages have not grown for many and fears of long-term financial insecurity are growing. These concerns, allied with the sense that the wealthy are getting wealthier, continue to fuel political discontent and link back to the populism mentioned earlier. Let me expand on the last point on rising inequality. I think it's an important theme to illustrate the risk landscape facing us. On the screen, we have the five global trends that risk experts agree will strongly inform global development over the next 10 years. I think this is a good case to illustrate how the risks I have expli explicated in the previous slides can be tied together in this particular instance. In 2016, rising income and wealth inequality has been the main driver in upsetting domestic social stability, geopolitical relations, and, the inter and international cooperation. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the United States election. Inequality has pr proceeded to exacerbate the polarization of societies and pave the way for increasingly inward-looking economic policies. But this rising inequality has found its sources in other trends as well. Automation, for instance, has taken away many low-income jobs which are poor people's livelihood in Asian countries. The International Labour Organization has estimated that millions of jobs will be lost in manufacturing in Asia as a result of intensifying automation in the region. Aging population is another trend that has exacerbated inequality. The increased burden on pension systems has meant that the oldest and the weakest will be hit the hardest. Finally, extreme weather events will also disproportionately displace the poorest, creating potential economic and social crises, such as in the form of forced migration. What I'm trying to drive home is the interconnectedness of different risks and risk trends that I have alluded to at the beginning of the presentation. We are facing a new risk ecosystem that poses a great challenge to achieving sustainable development. The World Economic Forum also conducts an annual survey with the business executives and asks them to rank the top concerns for doing business in their own country over the next 10 years. And here you see the top risk category selected per country in Asia Pacific. It's clear that the highest priority specific risk concerns vary significantly across the region, reflecting socioeconomic diversity, varied national interests, and recent events in each country. Given the topics already covered, I will pick out only a few stories here. The risk of natural catastrophes continues to be a high-profile threat. This is especially true for countries such as China, which are more prone to and have historically suffered great human and economic damages from these events. High unemployment is the number one risk on, on average across the region, and is also the top risk identified by business executives in South Korea. Wider economic concerns such as asset bubbles and energy price shock have always ranked highly in the region and continue to do so. Particularly concerns over a hard landing in China continue to be front of mind for many organizations as China transitions from an investment-led to a consumption-led growth model. The great challenge for SDGs is, their achievement, is that their achievement is dependent on the workings of a complex system complex ecosystem across government, the private sector, and civil society. At Marshall McLennan Companies, we believe there are two areas of risk management which all organizations, be they public or private, can benefit from focusing on in this evolving risk environment to ensure ongoing resilience to emerging threats. The first involves shifting the balance of effort from familiar risks 
to emerging threats and complex strategic uncertainties. Restless curiosity is essential, as, in the, as is the energization of risk identification processes to capture and characterize those real destroyers of value. In doing so, examine key trends and dependencies for the organization that amplify any potential impacts, and consider the human dimension as a risk amplifier, by which I mean both the scope for reputational issues to blow out of control, and also the damage that could be caused by rogue insiders, and increasingly rogue outsiders in this more sophisticated, more charged political climate. The second shift is from prevention to response. Protection in a barrier sense against some of the possible shocks is usually unfeasible or too costly. So contingency planning and testing based on a range of scenarios is critical, as is strategic agility. In a political and business landscape but is in some flux, organizations that have that versatility may be in a stronger position to thrive. And finally, my point is about stewardship. Perhaps more than ever, leaders from the public and private sector need to both hold bold strategic ambitions and organizational resilience in their heads at the same time to position themselves most effectively for the future. The Global Risk Report makes for somber reading every year. It's just simply the nature of the content. When correctly channeled, however, however, the report should ensure that we all maintain a healthy unease about the potential for global risks to hinder sustainable development. In turn, we must not become complacent and we must not be tempted into looking after individual interests rather than the collective good. Technological advancement continues at an astounding rate, and if we channel our progress co correctly and pool our respective capabilities, then we can ensure that we realize the goals of sustainable development for all. It's been an honor to represent Marsha McLennan at this inaugural Global Engagement and Empowerment Forum on Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mucharski, for your excellent presentation, but also keeping your time. <laughs> because we have a huge challenge to line up uh, so many distinguished speakers. Time management is my most difficult challenge. And some of you may wonder why this global risk landscape is relevant to our discussion today. So I will show you the uh, next slide, uh, which will uh, show why Sustainable Development Goals is designed to address 17 goals. As he said, global risk stems from unaddress not addressing root causes. And Sustainable Development Goals is designed to mitigate that risk by addressing the root causes starting from inequality, lack of decent jobs, climate change. And these, this is a, his, one of the, his earlier slides to show likelihood on the horizontal side, impact on the vertical side. And if you look at up far right, extreme weather, natural catastrophes are there, very likely and highly impactable. And these are the direct outcome of climate change. And weapons of mass destruction, goal 16, peace, justice, conflicts. So I will show the next slide, juxtapose sustainable development goals on these risks. So you can see 17 goals are perfectly matching this global risk landscape. And the next slide shows sustainable development goals, the likelihood and impact. So from these slides, we can take some conclusions. First, sustainable development goals implementation is necessary. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Second, it is urgent. The more time passes, the more likelihood, the more impact we'll have. So cost of action now will be far less than the cost of inaction down the road. So that's why, as uh, Mr. Muchaski emphasized in his last slide, prevention. 
really matters. And this is my, uh, my previous uh, portfolio, <laughs> disarmament. Maybe some of you uh, may not know that a uh, group of uh, renowned uh, atomic scientists set the doomsday clock at the beginning of every year. They started from 1947. And 2017, last year, it was set 2.2 and a half minutes close to midnight. This is the worst since the Korean War. So this is worse than the even peak of the Cold, Cold War times. And this reflects the existential threat we are facing from weapons of mass destruction, including in particular nuclear weapons, but also climate change and the likelihood and impact of technological developments on our lives. And this year, 2018, the clock <laughs> moved to two minutes before the midnight. So we are very close to catastrophe. So unless we act now and together, we cannot address these problems. And I'd like to now invite uh, uh, David uh, from uh, MMC to uh, elaborate a little bit about what are your takeaways in terms of uh, responding and addressing to uh, these uh, growing risks we are facing today. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a common saying that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. The point I, that I'd like to make is to demonstrate there's a historical accumulation factor in these risks. And in this era of instantaneous news and fast media, sometimes we forget our quite recent past of, say, the last 40 years. For example, if you look at the frequency of natural catastrophes since 1980, there is a clear and accelerating pace of increase in the frequency of natural disasters, implying potential impacts on biodiversity loss, implying food disruption possibilities, implying large economic losses. So the point I'm trying to make here in terms of climate change is that there is a clear historical magnifying trend that we should be aware of rather than just focusing on year-to-year -year events. In terms of um, income inequality, this graph shows the top 10% share of total income. And across the most developed nations since around 1980, we also see a clear trend of the share of income taken by the top 10%. And that hovers right now in terms of income around 40 to 50 percent. Now, if you look at also the top 10 percent share of wealth, it's even ex more exaggerated, meaning that particularly in the recent past, as the global economy has focused on measures like quantitative easing and monetary stimulus, there's been an effect on increased asset prices. And the wealth effect of that has gone much more to the top sector than a more equal trickle-down effect. So clearly here, there is also a trend during the last 40 years of intensifying. Now, when we look at demographics, this is just a cartoon to demonstrate the predicament that most developed countries face today, particularly in terms of, say, government budget deficits. And what that means is that as you, the society ages, naturally, the younger generation, being smaller, will be providing less tax revenues to the government system, whereas the burden of the elderly for social security and medical costs will naturally have to increase. Now, this is exemplified by the Japanese current government fiscal picture. 
And it's not only Japan, it's, I think, symptomatic of many developed countries where we have a very clear trend of decreasing tax revenues and increasing national expenditures, suggesting and demonstrating a very big deficit, a structural deficit. In fact, if you look at Japan, tax revenues only account for about half of the total national expenditures, meaning that the country has to borrow about half of what it spends. And this is not only for Japan, it's the case for many of the developed nations. So, you know, when we try to resort to fiscal stimulus, as being happening in many countries, we have this clear trend of fiscal deficit for the past 40 years that suggests that you know, furthering this will only increase the potential risks here. And I think, you know, most kind of dramatically, if you look at the overall picture of a country like the United States, and very similar to other developed countries, this is a picture of what's called total debt to GDP ratio. And you will see on the red line, that's the increase in debt over the past you know, dec um, century. But you will notice that debt growth and GDP growth are going together, which is good. That means you're borrowing and you're spending, creating GDP income. So that's sustainable and that's good. But if you look right around 1990, those two lines begin to diverge, meaning that you're borrowing more and more, but you're creating less economic growth. So hence that black line, which is the debt to GDP ratio, is increasing, and it's at, as Alex stated, over 300%. You will also see on the left-hand side that in 1929, just before the Great Depression, we had that spike on the left-hand side. That was the debt-to-GDP ratio just before the Great Depression. And you will see now, today, starting from around 1980, that that ratio is f far, far greater. So if you... Look at then not only the United States, but most of the developed areas. It's a similar picture that debt growth is far surpassing economic growth. And again, there's a clear suggestion here of economic unsustainability. You are borrowing more and more, and you're getting less out of it. So we call it marginal utility of debt is decreasing. To create one dollar of GDP, you're having to use more and more dollars of debt. So the point I'm trying to illustrate through these slides is that in this era of instantaneous news and fast media, we get sidetracked in looking at a finite point in time. But I think the bigger story here is that this isn't new in the sense of these risks building. It's been going on for 30 to 40 years, and it's also intensifying, which then naturally suggests the absolute need for sustainability. And to disregard sustainability would be almost you know, illogical. So I think looking at that historical picture over the last 30 to 40 years is critical to, to see that big trend and the increase in this trend, rather than just focusing on just the finite, one-time issue. The second point I think that we can take away from this is that there is a clear in interconnectedness of these risks. And if you, you know, it's, it's not maybe too clear on the slide, but for example, what it shows is that elevated asset prices can lead to a sudden financial crisis as happened nine years ago, leading to financial industry collapse, leading to social unrest, 
leading to political unilateralism. So I think we have only begun to understand this complex system of how these risks are all interrelated. And I think with the e era of internet and with much less resiliency and redundancy in our system, I think the unknown potential impacts of increasing risks and the interconnectedness again suggests why sustainable goals are an absolute necessity rather than a choice. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Although uh, David and I agreed that when we prepared uh, this presentation, we agreed not to be too alarmist, but <laughs> the underlying tone is quite alarming. But there is a bright side to this. Uh, if uh, we move back uh, to his last slide to show interconnectedness of these risk and development gaps, if I put another slide showing how our sustainable development goals, 17 goals, 169 targets are interconnected. So the picture becomes very clear that challenges are being compounded because of interconnectedness. So one symptom of our inaction, if I give you one example, the rising number of refugees. When Secretary General took over the United Nations 11 years ago, the total number of refugees, interna internally displaced people, were slightly over 20 million. But today, it is 65 million and still rising because we have so many conflicts going on in Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere. So with each day, the number of refugees is growing, but refugees is the symptom of man-made problems. So unless we address the root causes, unless we mitigate this risk by starting to act to implement SDGs, these risks will not get any better. And the next slide will show how these SDG goals and targets are interconnected with each other. So good news from this is if we find the solution in one area, it can also provide a solution to other areas. So action can spill over positively, but inaction will only compound the problems. So with that, uh, now I'd like to invite uh, our panelists up uh, on the stage. And with uh, the, the last slide, which shows sustainable development goals, the emblem we have in the O is a round shape, 17 colors, denoting each of the 17 goals. It shows interconnectedness and also it points to the need to integrate our action on sustainable development goals. Now, uh, the hard part begins for me because uh, we are very fortunate to assemble a very distinguished group of uh, panelists, many of them of my uh, close friends for last at least 10 years. And I will start with uh, Madame Bukova because uh, he was uh, in charge of UNESCO for the last 10 years, and education is an important enabler, not only on education goal, but to address other sustainable uh, goals as well. So I'll ask uh, Madame Bukova to tell us uh, more about what are the challenges you identified in trying to implement, first of all, MDG, which was set to uh, bring universal primary education. Primary means primary school level. But still, we have 60 million students out of school. When you started, I understand it's like 86 million. So you succeeded, but not completely. So how do you feel? Uh, what uh, would you have done differently <laughs> now to uh, close, close this gap? 
Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and first and foremost, of course, uh, my uh, congratulations and thanks go to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, to President Fisher uh, for this uh, debate, for this initiative. And I would immediately start by saying that um, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was the first uh, leader to put education on the global political agenda. And I insist on the political agenda because it was so important to draw the attention of political leaders on the necessity to look at education as a foundation of human development, as a cross-section of all the challenges that uh, we just spoke, and uh, uh, including the risks, because education is fundamental for poverty uh, eradication. It is important for climate to understand, to uh, have education for climate change, for sustainability. It is vital for health, uh, for gender equality, for water management, and the list uh, can, uh, can go on. But uh, you asked me about the challenges, and uh, the good news is that we have the most educated uh, generation uh, ever in human history. On the other side, of course, we know that still there is unfinished business from the MDGs. As you said, 60 million uh, children are out of school, and the majority of them are in conflict areas. And I think this is very much linked also to our previous uh, discussion. But there are also new challenges, because with the new migration, with the climate change and others, we see that uh, this young generation are uh, affected. On the other side, because of poor quality of education, we know that more than 250 million young people Albeit they have been in some formal schooling, are practically, functionally, as our experts say, illiterate. So the challenge in the preparation for the uh, uh, MDGs, uh, SDGs, uh, and in education was to put quality education as one of the foundations. And this is what uh, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon's initiative, uh, JEFI Education First. Uh, was uh, composed to put quality of education also into the heart of uh, educational efforts. And then, of course, to look at education in a holistic manner, uh, not to be confined also to primary, but also to move the secondary, and goal number four uh, already provides for compulsory primary and secondary education, which is a historic achievement, I would say, of the international community and of uh, the United Nations. And then to look at skills. Education is not a technical issue. Education is about skills. It is about learning. And nowadays, with the new technologies, with the transforming economy, with some jobs being uh, transformed, and we practically do not know even what will be the jobs for the future, we know that we are moving towards a new type of economy, the fourth industrial revolution, as the World Economic Forum. Uh, is, uh, is naming, we need different skills. And this is also the difficulty to adjust to these uh, difficult skills. And then, looking at the globalization, looking at the migration, looking at the conflict, looking at the new challenges, this is about global citizenship education, which was the third pillar of uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's initiative that UNESCO supported strongly. It is about global citizenship education. It is education for sustainable development. It is education for climate change. It is about living together. It is about global competences. Because we see in the world with the rising uh, xenophobia, with the rising nationalistic policies, we think that uh, education should give also some values. The values of human rights, the values of living together, uh, different competences, civic, uh, I would say, competences of young people. So all together this represents nowadays this, uh, this global picture. Now you ask me uh, what I might have done differently. Uh, well, I think uh, reaching out uh, earlier on to partners. Uh, I'm very happy that I have next to me also uh, Mrs. Min, who is uh, from the CJ, a wonderful partnership that we have. Uh, uh, with, uh, with the CJ on, on education, on girls' education, on STEM education. Um, I'm looking also at Jean Todt uh, from the uh, uh, World Federation, International Federation of Automobilists, and he will be speaking, I hope, about road safety partnership on education and road safety uh, for young. I think maybe early on I would have reached out and forged these partnerships because I think nowadays education is a societal 
responsibility, not just uh, UNESCO International, not just governments, but all the society, private sector, civil society and partners. Thank you, Madam Bokova, and also uh, uh, thanks for uh, leading to our next uh, presenter as well, uh, because um, as you said, uh, current generations living on Earth, particularly maybe young generation, I think most educated, but they are the ones who have been very unfortunate since the global economic crisis hits us. The youth unemployment rate is at least twice higher than the average unemployment rate. So highly educated, without decent jobs, where this fr frustration from young generation will go. So it, 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 is, it will serve to fuel the violent extremism, one example. So I think the role of the corporate sector is vital, not only in uh, promoting sustainable development goals uh, through uh, corporate social responsibility related work, but also uh, empowering the youth, educating the youth to find uh, appropriate uh, workplaces to uh, show their talents. And I think uh, uh, I understand that CJ has done a lot uh, on both accounts, so maybe uh, Dr. Min can talk about uh, uh, more about uh, your experience, but also maybe uh, you can give us uh, your maybe one valuable lesson learned. Thank you. So floor is yours. Successful companies, or you know, including CJ, I like to say, we've been always trying to align our business strategy with the social values. Um, there is a, always has been expectations that the society put on, on the corporations, such as creating jobs, paying taxes, and um, you know, like in general, prosper. And then, or even these days, like climate change, these are the the downside or risk factors that corporations are expected to take more responsibilities on. So, uh, but today I think uh, I'll be focusing on um, these days how the corporations uh, have a better strategy to align its profitability or corporate strategy with the social, um, social agenda. And I think one area that I want to start with is SDG has given us a really good frame uh, work to really map out what we should do as a global social uh, citizen. And I think one area was that the corporations now realize the importance of uh, the, their active role solving societal problems. And I think the furthermore, uh, many companies, including CJ, we actually realized that in, um, in 1913, I mean 2013, we, um, we uh, announced that we will be a socially responsible company with the, um, the CSV principle, which is creating shared value. So whatever, when we do business, there are some social values that we are creating at the same time. And when we did that, uh, CJ, um, most of Koreans, I'm sure all Koreans know, but uh, for those of global participants, CJ is a lifestyle company. Our business stems from um, food, but we are now into entertainment and logistics and uh, retail. And when we actually map out what is relevant to us out of that uh, SDG goals, um, every single one of them has a, some relevance to our business. So we are trying to align our long-term business strategy with uh, the SDG goals. And I think one of the areas that we were able to do that is that if we actually could use our platform and the business, the core, um, um, core competency, then we could actually make a bigger impact. So one example, as Madame Bukova said, is uh, our girls' education campaign. When we first met five years ago, we just said, okay, it's a culture company, and then UNESCO with the culture, there might be something we could do. And then we soon realized that the impact that our uh, K-pop stars can make into a young generation globally, uh, like for example, BTS, like very popular Korean uh, boy idol group, 
has a fan club of 12 million official fan club, and then they are reachable 20 million like immediately. And if these people can carry uh, during their concerts uh, the importance of this uh, social cause, for us it was a so girls' education, the importance of education, particularly girls' education, the impact was huge. So I think these are the examples that what corporation can do as a partnership, and then I think as the corporations realize what they have uh, in terms of the capability uh, or the, um, I think the impact point with the customers, there are even bigger partnership models can come out. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Min. And as you said, uh, moving from CSR, corporate social responsibility, emphasizing responsibility of the business sector, to CSV, creating shared values, I think is a better and win-win concept for both businesses yes. and the public sector. Yes. Because unless we make it uh, profitable and sustainable, uh, this cannot go on. And uh, moving from CSR to CSV is a very important uh, uh, direction we have to travel. And we'll hear more about this uh, in the uh, next uh, special conversation between Sec uh, Secretary General Ban and Chairman Ma. And also uh, tomorrow morning, we'll have another session with the chairman of SK Holdings, uh, Ch Chete Won, about social enterprises. So thank you very much for your presentation. And the next panelist is Zhang Tot, another longtime friend of Secretary General and me. And uh, he is a legendary figure, first in car racing. How many championships you won with Michael Schumacher? Maybe 10, 11 at Ferrari? And then he converted to an advocate for road safety. <laughs> From car racing to road safety. So when, when I rode with him in a very nice car, I mean, he's driving always very nice car, then he, he will last start the car unless I buckle up, <laughs> even in the back seat. So he's now a total convert, and he's uh, very much convinced that uh, reducing road accidents is a very good way to implement sustainable development goals in many ways, because it will reduce not only child and youth fatalities, but also it will reduce health care bill. So why don't you talk about your campaign about uh, road safety, and I think you are leading the effort road safety decade, and uh, you are now passing the midpoint of that, so uh, please tell us more about how you feel about uh, your road safety campaign. Thank you, Won Su. But maybe before answering this question, uh, I think I have a little, uh, very short video I would like uh, to show, I mean, to demonstrate the fight for children in developing countries to go from one side of the road to the other side of the road. So if we could have access to this uh, three minutes uh, movie.
I mean, after those sad images, but I mean, that's a reality. Road crashes is one uh, of the worst pandemic of the society at the level of HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. Every year, 1.3 million people die on the road. 50 million people are injured. We'll see 500 kids die every day. 3,500 people die every day. And um, I mean, and I want to thank the SG Ban Ki-moon uh, first to have appointed me as his special envoy, and you are mentioning my past career in racing. I mean, it is true. I mean, I've been involved with a lot uh, of motor racing categories, but for me, motor racing is not only a show, it's also a laboratory. Because, I mean, at the moment, I mean, compared to what was happening 30 years ago and now, I mean, you almost have not any more fatal accidents during motor racing. So we must consider that motor racing has to be a laboratory. And uh, the SG decided the decade of action for road safety, uh, which was essential 2011, 2020, with a very ambitious challenge to half the number of victims on the road by 2020. And unfortunately, it is not happening. And we have the prescriptions. It's around uh, education, law enforcement, but I mean, there is a big problem. How do we enforce uh, laws in countries where there is corruption with the police? Vehicles, road infrastructures, and post-crash care. And uh, fortunately, road safety has also been included in the SDG with a target 3.6, which is to halve the number of victims on the road by 2020, and target 11.2, which is to give access to public transportation to any citizen around the world by 2030. And um, I mean, very simple things. You are mentioning safety belt, <laughs> helmet, speeding, text driving, drink driving. I mean, simple actions will half by two the number of victims of the road. So that's the fight where we are at the moment. And uh, it's not only the responsibility of the governments, but it's the responsibility of every single citizen who is a road user. I mean, every citizen is a road user. So everybody must behave properly. And of course, the governments must participate to that. Uh, UN agencies, and I'm happy to see my friend Shamshad Akbar, the executive secretary of UN ESCAP, was the responsibility of securing and applying road safety in all the region, but all the other agencies. It's one of the topics we will have the responsibility to discuss with the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizen, World Bank, Regional Bank, Red Cross. Uh, Irina Bokova was talking also about the FIA members, but we need to address it as an urgency, otherwise by 2030, we will not have 1.3 million people dying on the road, but 2 million people dying on the road and 80 million of people injured, which, I mean, we are talking about figures, we are talking about economy, but depending on the country, it's about 1 to 5% of the GDP of every country having the prescription of knowing what to do and taking into consideration that road safety is considered and has to be considered as a human right. Thank you so much, John. And uh, your last point on contributing 1.5% of GDP is a lot of money as compared to maybe the cost we need on advocacy campaign is maybe 0.001%. <laughs> so it is a good investment and we must do it. And Zhang has an added advantage because when we do advocacy campaign, we need a celebrity face. And his wife is with us somewhere, Michelle Liu. Why don't you stand up? <laughs> she acted as the lady, Aung San Suu Kyi. And she is better known as uh, in uh, Majara's movie, uh, Crouching Tiger, as uh, we 
Koreans call your name Yang Ja Gyeong. <laughs> so whenever Zhang uh, travels, he brings Michelle with him, and then it is a really good uh, publicity and advocacy campaign. And next uh, panelist we have is uh, Mr. Lee Jae Young. Uh, he's a former parliamentarian, and the reason we uh, brought him here is that because of the gloomy uh, economic picture David uh, uh, presented earlier, we cannot expect the budget, particularly from the developed countries, to grow for official development assistance. And it means that financing by the government must be approved by the parliament. And whatever guidelines, global standards, we agree at the global level at the United Nations, action must start from locally. So the role of parliament and local governments are crucial in the implementation of SDG. So the floor is yours. So when I first heard about MDG in 2000, I thought, great. Uh, it's the start of new millennia. Uh, I think the world over the past 50 to 100 years has amassed great extreme uh, wealth. So it's time to distribute. And most importantly, I think it was possible. But when I heard about SDGs a uh, couple of years ago, my first reaction was impossible because the complexity of achieving these 17 goals is beyond just moving from eight goals to 17. Because now the goals takes or it needs uh, a national politics. You need to enter the realm of national politics. Now, leaving out the details, I think there needs to be two things to uh, have successful SDGs. One is like, as ambassadors mentioned, is financing. But surprisingly, I don't worry too much about financing because I think there are enough vehicles on both public sector and private sector out there to finance these things, especially long-term projects, actually. And I think there are enough creative ways, and there have been introduced several times, and a small example is maybe Gavi, uh, is that we could come up with some very innovative financing ways to support these programs. And on the national level, especially in the developed countries who would have to burden a lot of these financing, I think the important thing is that constituents are becoming more educated, the importance of uh, support these programs. And when it comes to national assembly level, it became a lot easier for politicians to uh, convince constituents as well as other, uh, other people to, that we need to support these programs. So financing, I don't worry about too much. But I think the challenge will come from the legislation piece because every single goals uh, talked about in SDGs will need either new fresh, a slew of new fresh legislations or amending existing legislations. And obviously different countries will take different approach. But for example, in Korea, we have a legislation piece called sustainability uh, development. It's actually called Sustainability Development Act which was enacted in 2007. But this piece itself is very much geared towards environmental issues. In order for us to move and support SDGs from national perspective, now we have to amend this issue so that we can include more broad and holistic approach to uh, SDGs. That has been enacted or the amendment has been introduced to National Assembly, I think, recently, uh, but it hasn't been even came to the discussion yet. Now, given all the developing countries, I think it's gonna take time and lots of effort to push any piece of legislation. But we have, we have a set date for SDGs, which is by 2030, we have to achieve certain level of achievements. But in developed countries, it'll be very, very difficult to push any of these legislations. For example, you talked about the uh, car accidents and the road safety. Changing a, any piece or small piece on road safety on developed countries, it's gonna take years. Maybe on underdeveloped countries it might be faster, but in Korea, it could take minimum two to three years. My personal experience, 
I was, when I was serving at the National Assembly from 12 to 16, my first uh, legislation, which I introduced in 2012, June, was passed in 2016, January. So it takes a lot of time. And also, it becomes very difficult to make your constituents understand the importance of these legislation pieces. So it's not only, it's not only difficult to educate your constituents, but I think a lot of time national politicians do not understand the importance of the sustainable development. So in order to educa educate them at all levels, we need more conversation or dialogue between the UN or people in, involved in these uh, particular projects with national assembly or parliamentary levels. However, my experience as a person who's been advocate of SDGs, both MDG and SDGs, uh, my personal experience with UN or any of these global institutions is that they really are poor in communicating with national level politicians. I think they're doing better and they do extremely well with civil societies, but when it comes to national politics, they do poor jobs. So in order for this uh, SDGs to move forward, I think UN uh, government obviously will play an extremely important role, but UN needs to be more active and proactive in terms of contacting with the national politicians. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, and also I must thank you uh, for your efforts uh, you have done when you are a parliamentarian, because he led the study group of Korean parliamentarians on MDG. And uh, one of the members uh, is uh, current prime minister of Korea, and also he has done it with, uh, with the help of uh, his distinguished mother, Ambassador Do Young Shim, who is uh, with us uh, as an SDG advocate. So uh, we, we are missing you. Once uh, you left the uh, parliament, uh, we hope uh, other parliamentarians will follow your example to lead uh, another study group on SDGs. And the next panelist we have is uh, Ed Futa. He has been with uh, Rotary International, I think, for your lifetime. And you have been the general secretary for 12 years. And the reason we invite him is to is that uh, we want to listen to him from one of the very important and longest running campaign the private sector has been doing with international organizations like UN and WHO, polio eradication. So for the last 32 years, we have been successful in reducing the number of polio affected countries. Now it is, we have only three left, but even it has been like that uh, for the last 10 years. <laughs> so going that uh, final mile <laughs> is extremely difficult. And we run the risk of if we fail in that last mile, we'll go back to all the way back to scratch one. So I think uh, the how to finish up uh, what you have started together with other international partners like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United Nations will uh, tell us a lot about how we can do partnership better. Floor is yours. Thank you very much for your introduction of the topic, which is uh, very germane to what we're talking about. And Relying on what you mentioned and what our last speaker mentioned about the global implications of a project and the local start and the local buy-in, I think that's where we complete the trend or the link. Rotary International, through its 33,000 Rotary clubs in that many communities, provides the on-the-ground community link that is essential to accomplishing, successfully accomplishing these types of global projects. So we are successful in putting together a collaborative effort of, an, of immense scale. As I mentioned earlier, when we started this 30 years ago, um, we started it 
by focusing on something that could be achieved, but something that was monumental. There were 1,000 new cases of polio daily in the world, so it's 365,000 cases of polio um, when we started. Last year, there were 27 in three countries, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Nigeria had been uh, subsequently uh, polio-free, but they have to be polio-free for at least two years. They did not achieve that. Polio came back in one neighborhood in northern Nigeria, and so they're back on the list. This year, we have, we have uh, zero cases so far since January 1st. It's a very short time, but we have zero. So it shows uh, the immense movement from where we started the project to where we are today, and our success in putting together an international and broadly based stakeholder partnership community. Um, we, we were successful because we kept the goal in mind. And even the end game is even more important because as you said, if you don't, you can be one inch from the finish line. If you don't cross it, you don't achieve the goal. And, and that's important because were we not to achieve the goal of eradicating polio, the second d disease to be eradicated from humankind, who knows the first disease to be eradicated from humankind? Anybody in this room know? Yes. Smallpox. 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 You're right. Smallpox was the first disease eradicated from humankind, and it's uh, smallpox has been uh, totally eradicated. Polio, of course, uh, when eradicated, will be the second, and it will be, uh, but uh, governments and medical labs around the world want to keep the virus for a reason, because polio can be reinfected on, the, on, on populations tactically as a weapon. So that's, you see, so we destroy something that can't be used as a weapon, but we keep something that can probably be used in the future as a weapon, but we'll keep it for study for, for several more years before it's the scientific or medical community has agreed that it can be completely eliminated. But uh, putting this coalition together and keeping them together, as Ambassador Kim had alluded to, it's been a long time. Discipline is important, folks, and so that's what we brought to the table is, is a laser focus on where we need to be and why we need to be. Because can you imagine a world without polio? Can you imagine the reallocation of, of resources, precious resources, from polio treatment and, and prevention to education, for example? It's going to be a monumental shift in financial resources globally. So this, this is, it has a ripple effect. We cannot just say we've eliminated a disease from affecting humankind and that's it. The global effect will be uh, global and universal. And so that's part of the, I have other lessons learned. We have lots of lessons learned, but I see I'm two seconds here and I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you for keeping your time on time and thanks uh, for staying the course and persisting in finishing this uh, final mile and he he ended his presentation with the financial requirement to finish finish it off he said uh, from 27 to 0 and staying there he, he told me it will require 2 billion new investment so just eradicating polio, if you put it in the broader context of all SDG goals and targets implemented, you can imagine how much money we we'll need to implement it. Thank you so much. Next panelist uh, represents the brain power of Yonsei University. <laughs> and we, we cannot be complete uh, without uh, uh, listening to uh, brain power of Yonsei University, Professor So, 
and uh, he will talk about the importance of higher education. So building on uh, quality education, education for global citizenship, road safety, and other sectors. Please tell us more about the importance of the higher education. Thank you. Um, I'll begin with a, um, a slight PR about our university, um, if you, with your um, permission. Yonsei University uh, is a living example of how a nation can rise from poverty to success through education. Uh, missionary workers um, funded by private sector, um, for instance, Underwood uh, sold typewriters to, to fund us, and uh, Severance um, was one of the um, richest corporations at that time, and it funded um, medical education in Korea. But it was not simply higher education. They also um, entered at the level of uh, primary and also secondary education. So it was education on all fronts. And because of such contributions, Korea was able to um, endure um, major setbacks, such as colonization, war, and, um, um, and extreme poverty following the war. Um, so Korea is uh, now one of the few, if not the only country, that has risen from being a recipient of aid to uh, becoming a donor country. Uh, so how can universities um, now in Korea, especially Yonsei University, um, move towards deploying education around the globe? Um, the model of education that we witnessed um, in the formation of Yonsei University is still um, valid as Yonsei now looks toward uh, the world as a donor of education. Um, but I, I fear that um, possibly we might not be uh, a valid model for long um, because of sustainability issues. Um, so now, um, instead of talking about Yonsei University, I would like to broaden the scope to include higher education um, as a whole um, and its role in global education. Uh, we can work with local communities around the globe at all levels of education, from primary through secondary to tertiary, and um, la last but not least to um, vocational training and education. Um, we can even help build infrastructures, educational infra infrastructures, specifically through information um, and communication technology. Uh, so, here's the thing, obviously because given the lack of resources, uh, most importantly lack of funding, higher education cannot move alone. Um, only this morning uh, in a parallel session on quality education and the role of ICTs, much of the focus was directed at how to engage the private sector, where corporations are wary of um, putting in their money where there is no profit. So this is understandable because without some kind of a profit promised, even well-meaning initiatives may not be sustainable, the key word that concerns us all uh, at this moment. Therefore, governments and international agencies such as UN and UNESCO will play um, still um, a most crucial role in the partnership between education, public, and private sectors uh, in deploying education. And yet, as has been demonstrated by the efforts of CJENM together with UNESCO, funding does not simply mean monetary support. There are other resources, and the most important is human resource. This is where we come back to um, the role of higher education in reaching SDG goals. Um, Yonsei, because of its missionary roots, has already been socially engaged, and uh, we work in Mongolia, Vietnam, Africa, um, and most places in Southeast Asia, and uh, it has been amply re uh, recorded, but on the university level, we are just beginning to wake up. We have so many members who are participating uh, in these activities, uh, but we do not yet uh, have a who's who or who's doing what um, database. So there is so much overlap and loss. We need a lot knowledge place that guides us to um, you know, what we have done so far and where particularly and what we have learned from our experience in deploying education globally. Um, Ernest Ciroli has brought up an important um, issue called uh, enterprise facilitation, where you never initiate anything, where you never motivate anybody, but where you become a servant to local passion. 
I think this applies to us here. Um, what he's talking about is the need for us to listen to the local needs, the educational needs of those to whom we are offering our services. Uh, and we need to tell, we, we, we shouldn't tell them that you need this or that, because what we can offer them is based upon only our experience and our situation. We need to study them and work with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing uh, your experiences and your insights. And uh, I think it is very befitting to hear from Yonsei University professor about the importance of higher education because Yonsei is the birthplace of the modern higher education in Korea. So thank you so much. And Alex, now we are back to where we started. <laughs> you started uh, this uh, uh, session with your presentation. And in your last slide, you referenced that trying to do more to prevent and enhance preparedness, it is always cost effective than trying to respond after something bad happens. And in doing that, uh, how do you see corporate sector can help public sector, both at national and international level? Thank you. So go back about 50, 60 years, and you would build your factory on a hill, and you would get some steel and stick it into the, with the concrete, and that would probably protect you. But now we have, uh, we're globalized, we have um, supply chains, and we actually have customer chains. Okay, and the floods in, floods in Thailand relatively recently, um, I think were a, 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 a sad indication of what happens when you don't think too much about the impact of an event on both your customers, your clients, and actually your employees. Um, so you're affecting the community, the community's affected, the company's affected, the workers are affected. So sophisticated risk mapping, and basically what, what I presented was a sort of a risk map anyway, um, allows you to look at the interconnect interconnectivity of risk, follow your suppliers, try and make sure that they also have the same rigor that you have on their businesses. Um, insurance plays a part, but insurance is actually the end result. The main thing is to identify your risk, quantify your risk, manage risk, I mitigate it if you can, transfer it to others if, if they are best uh, to look after it, and then obviously insurance. Now, there's a big insurance gap for one, the underserved, and secondly, most, uh, most sovereign states don't believe in insurance themselves. And, and I think that part of that is, um, first of all, it's a cost, and most politicians are in power for a certain amount of time. And if I happen to say, okay, let's go and buy premiums for our infrastructure, and nothing happens during my term, and then three weeks into the, 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 the opposition party's term, bad things happen, and yet there's this wonderful insurance program, they become the heroes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's one. And the other thing is I think there's I think there's a belief that there's quite a lot of corruption in the insurance negotiation process. And uh, we talked about it uh, uh, this morning. You know, we, we, we do believe uh, we actually have created a, a Dutch auction capability where you can see capital um, offering to provide insurance um, and fighting downwards in order to be able to, uh, to, take to, to provide its capacity. So I think, you know, this will be the third person who says that there should be a budget item for insurance. <laughs> um, but I think that if we could take out the politics from the fact that insurance, that mitigation, risk management, and insurance are actually um, something that is valuable over a long period of time and, and across terms of office, it should actually become, in my view, a budget um, 
item and a percentage, maybe not very much, um, but one that is constant. So you just take out that factor. Um, but there's, we're in a much better position than we were, were a few years ago. And the other thing is modeling is much better. And there is so much money, there's so much capital chasing a return. And particularly environmental risks, are non there's no correlation with normal investments and so on. That I think that, um, and I know that you know, the uh, United Nations with the Insurance Forum, Development Forum, um, and the International Insurance Society and other organizations are trying to figure out how to do this. So I'm optimistic. Thank you. Um, as you clearly indicated, uh, there is a clear convergence between in industry, for example, insurance industry and uh, international public sector. If we work together to mitigate uh, risks from environmental degradation, climate change, natural disasters, it will clearly also help insurance industry as well. So there is a lot of areas uh, we can act together. With that, uh, I think we managed to uh, reserve some time for discussion from the floor. So please feel free to ask your question to any of our panelists. And while you are thinking of uh, your questions, maybe I can ask uh, Shamjad to say something about uh, what uh, ESCAP is doing for partnership in, in this region. She is uh, executive secretary of ESCAP, UN ESCAP, based in uh, Bangkok. Or maybe somebody will bring a microphone to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. Uh, can people hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you for um, picking on me. I was just sending a message <laughs> to the office. So um, I uh, wanted to share with you uh, that sustainable development goals have been under a lot of debate. And there has been phenomenal advocacy of sustainable development. But as I walk through different countries and different platforms, I think there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and education is, of course, uh, very critical of it in terms of explaining how the architecture has been conceptualized, designed, and intended to be implemented. I think from our standpoint at the Regional Commission, and we are the largest regional commission of uh, being the Asia-Pacific together, uh, the key thing is um, to talk more about the uh, uniqueness of sustainable development, which is the integration of the three pillars. And I think it is very difficult to get a partnership that is really looking at how the interdependence between economic, social, and environment mm, um, dynamics works in terms of effective implementation. So I want to preface uh, this with that. The second thing is, of course, we have a lot of partnerships um, um, at a regional level because we do want to bring in the regional element more squarely. There are academics and think tanks with whom we are partnering, and then there are policy organs that we are uh, 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 coordinating with. I have to say that the key thing for us is to continue looking at the regional dimension and not just at the national level. So our biggest partnership is with countries that are really promoting regional cooperation and integration. And I'm zeroing in on this because there are several partners, but the uniqueness of the regional commissions is to really be able to contribute and bring value addition to the transboundary goals. And it is very difficult. There's one set of goals which are nationally driven goals, but the transboundary goals require different types of partnership. And I think one unique thing that we are very fortunate in Asia that's happening is that some of the, uh, although multilateralism and globalization, which is very critical for sustainable development, is being shunned by some uh, countries, but it is being reinforced uh, on the platform of uh, 
uh, Asia and mm -hmm. Pacific as a whole. So we are uh, trying to look at where can we develop transboundary goal partnerships. And one very concrete example, and I will stop after that, is really an art net. You know, there's a huge debate about trade and investment, which has existed for uh, several decades. But I think we have to recognize that means of implementation is not only just finance, but it's trade and investment. We have developed what we call an art network, which is really looking at promoting trade and investment across the small and medium enterprises and it has an element of economic empowerment because with the small medium enterprises, you are able to develop more sustainable development itself. Uh, there are several unique um, partnerships like that, but in interest of time, I'll stop there. But to underscore the point that United Nations is a very unique agency because it has five regional commissions and all regional commissions are critical in terms of ensuring that there is policy coherence and consistency across the implementation of the sustainable development goals, but also in helping out implementation of, say, water, disaster risk reduction, ICT connectivity through broadband. And we have in each of these partnerships with different um, private sector as well as the public sector entities. Thank you. Thank you, Shamshad, uh, for sharing uh, your insights. And uh, I think I, I just noticed, me, uh, maybe it's by coincidence, that uh, she served as G20 Sherpa of the UN. And uh, right behind you, we had uh, Korean G20 Sherpa, <laughs> and then uh, moved uh, to uh, Washington as Korean ambassador. He just came back, and uh, I'd like to invite him, because I'm dictating now who should... <laughs> Uh, make comments and ask questions to uh, wait uh, for the questions come from the floor. So, Ambassador An, uh, please uh, share uh, your views uh, coming from your experience uh, through G20 process, working with the UN, and how you perceive sustainable development goals, meaning whether you agree with uh, my uh, conclusion that uh, SDG is urgent, and SDG is necessary, and we must act now, and we must act together. So please share insights with us. Microphone. Second row. Well, thank you, and then congratulations. But at the same time, thank you so much for giving me the floor, because this is only several months that I came to Seoul, and then this is such an opportunity to be uh, extending my greeting to all of you, not only Korean audience, but also international audience. But at the same time, this is most unexpected. I was so, not expecting to say uh, anything here. Surprise attack. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But at the same time, this is something I could be telling you, which is, G20, of course, it was created back in uh, 2008 in response to, to something called global financial crisis. And uh, the thing is, having been a part of the process, it, in fact, uh, in a sense, uh, well, prepared me to be, in a sense, sent sensitized to so many different set of issues. Not only uh, for the fiscal crisis, not only for the financial crisis, but at the same time, for, what is the financial price, uh, crisis? Financial crisis leads to economic crisis. Economic crisis leads to political crisis. Political crisis leads to social crisis. And then as a matter of fact, one of the message which came to me very clear to me during the past two hours of discussion, mm. it was something called, quote, unquote, interconnectedness of all those issues. So one thing which, in fact, is becoming clearer and clearer to me, having said 
in this meeting for the pa uh, past two hours. It is interconnectedness of the world, it is connected, interconnectedness of the issues we have to face, it is interconnectedness of all the issues we have mentioned, meaning education, corporate sector, uh, road safety, the role to be played by politicians, role to be played by medical doctors and educators, and Cassandra's, I have to say. <laughs> Cassandra coming from... Uh, Cassandra Mouth. <laughs> where? where? Uh, one of the most uh, highly respected institutions for the time being, namely World Economic Forum. Maybe next, next spring you may wish to invite me. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, once again, Ambassador Kim, thank you so much, and all the best for everybody present here. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador An, uh, for sharing your insights. Still, nobody wants to ask a question? There's a lady. Thank you for coming to Yonsei University. I'm Yonsei University. My name is Alchike Abigaim. And I want to ask Madame Bokova, uh, what are you doing to enhance the quality of environmental education globally in relationship to climate change and uh, sustainable development in primary schools? Thank you so much. Primary schools? Yeah. At the primary school? Yes. <laughs> As I said uh, uh, at the outset, I am a deep believer that education is the foundation of uh, all the other uh, sustainable development goals. It's in the intersection of uh, the three pillars uh, about economy, uh, society, development, social inclusion, and environment. And from that point of view, uh, UNESCO has been also the lead agency in an important area of education, education for sustainable development. ESD actually started well before the SDGs were adopted. In 2013, we closed the United Nations decade of education for sustainable development with a big conference in each in Nagoya, and we adopted a plan of action. Now, on the global level, and by the way, in the targets of goal number four, if you look at the targets that are there, we have ESD as one of the targets. So incorporating it uh, into the uh, school systems is vital. It means a curricular, it means, of course, a teacher training, it means the extracurricular activities, it means partnerships, and linking it to all the efforts to mitigate and to uh, uh, give responses to climate change. Uh, because I'm a deep believer also that without changing our mentality, the way we consume, the way we uh, produce, the way we lead our daily lives, it will be impossible to give the right response to the climate change. So this is exactly into intersection of uh, 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 education for sustainable development and all the other SDGs that I think the, uh, uh, we will find the right, the right answers. Thank you. Back there. Gentlemen, I think over there, we have a good gender balance. <laughs> In asking questions, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Alex Hill. I'm a graduate student pursuing a master's in international cooperation here at Yonsei's GSIS. And I wanted to begin by thanking you all for coming here and sharing your insight. Uh, I noticed the dominant theme of the conversation has been the need for partnership with the private sector, with the celebrities, with NGOs and other uh, members of the private sector, private institutions. But it seems that uh, notably absent from the conversation is any consensus on the central role for government um, in mobilizing society around these massive goals. Uh, not only because of the resources it has, but because of the interests that it has which are aligned with the SDGs. And to that effect, I'm wondering whether this focus on the private sector is uh, the result of the real need for the private sector to be so thoroughly involved, or rather whether it's a symptom of the hollowing out of the state sector, the decline of the tax base since around the 1970s and 1980s that accompanied neoliberal policies of declining corporate taxes, the hollowing out of uh, government coffers and so on. So um, 
am I wrong? Is there not more of a need for the government to actually have the resources and leadership role to be central in this process? Or is there something about the changing nature of the global economy that necessitates such a dominant role for the private sector in tackling these social and economic issues? Thank you for the question. Who is the closest among panelists to the government? Maybe Mr. Lee. Yeah. Um, I'm not in the government, but I, I, maybe I was not clear in my presentation, but when I say my initial reaction uh, to SDGs was impossible, it's because the role of government and politics in general has become very difficult to achieve these goals, or at least when I see it in further out. But do I still feel that way? No, because I think it, when I talk to a lot of you know, my peers in politics and government, uh, government uh, they see the need and they see the necessity and they all feel that SDGs is something that we must do. Now, when it, I think when it comes to private sector, uh, they do have a bit of advantage because they have a means to move faster than government. And like I said in my presentation, the one thing that is very critical to make SDGs successful in time is to push through a bunch of legislations. But as I said, there is a challenge, there's an innate challenge, which is that when it comes to pushing through legislations, it just takes time. It takes time because like I said, you need to convince your constituents, you have to convince your oppositions, and governments, Many times, as you know, uh, when they introduce some of their uh, greater di direction of where nation, uh, nation needs to go, you meet with lots and lots of different stakeholders. So the process itself takes long time. So many times you might feel that governments are not doing enough, but I think in order to achieve SDG, the major partner, if not the most important partner that SDG needs to have is governments, for sure. But each government at different level and different region, they have different cultures and they're obviously they will take a different approach to solve SDGs. So, you know, it's, it's, it'll be very difficult, for example, for UN to have any tailor-made sort of program for each country because, you know, you will lack the resource and you lack time. Uh, but, and you would have to rely a lot on general theme and general message uh, and educating all these governments and when they get together in one place. Uh, but, you know, there's no doubt that most important partner that you need to have to make sure that SDGs move forward is government. And you saw, for example, uh, you know, SDGs until 20, well, at least it says 2030, but it's beyond, actually. But, you know, democratic society, you would have different types of government in place in the same country. And as we saw in the example of, you know, climate action, uh, look what U.S. has done before and after they change the administration. So you will see many challenges coming forward when it comes to dealing with the government and state. But nevertheless, despite those challenges, the most important partner that you should have, we should have, is government. And I'm saying below that level, because it becomes all national strategy and national you know, uh, achievements needs to do uh, done through local level. I mean, for example, the, the legislation piece that I talked about, it'll set the tone for where we need to do for the sustainable development from Korea's perspective. But that legislation has to go through uh, a subcommittee of a committee that is made of six people. And six legislators, six politicians will make a decision and have a discussion on this piece of legislation that's going to affect the Korea's policy on sustainability for next 15 years to maybe hundreds of years. So, you know, in that sense, it's going to take lots of educating and lots of, you know, conversation between not only amongst the local, you know, uh, partners, but, you know, I think my last point was the UN and these international organizations do much more job in terms of, you know, getting closer with uh, local politicians. And, you know, at the end of the day, like I, now, I am not only convinced, but I, think that sustainable SDGs is something that we must do. Otherwise, this is, this is almost a life or death situation without it. Thank you. Of course, I mean, the role of government, particularly central government, is crucial. And uh, maybe 
it is so obvious uh, we didn't emphasize it um, too much. But Dr. Min may want to add. Uh, I want to add the corporate points of view. Um, uh, the, any, uh, when we do the partnerships, uh, we are welcome. We will be wor willing to work with any party who brings uh, the key elements, which is usually to their core competencies, into the table. We're welcome. Uh, but I think, it, so for example, government can play a very important role, especially when we do the project in developing countries. Uh, when we do the rural development uh, project in Vietnam the, to improve the food chain, we worked very closely with the government because they were bringing um, uh, important factors, which is uh, like helping us with the regulations and all that. But I think uh, if we, um, mostly we are working independently. Uh, when it was uh, only the uh, corporations making monetary or financial contributions, that's uh, usually the government's lead or some hint that we probably, you know, that in the old days we might do that. But right now, the companies, uh, the sustainability is very important. And then only the companies, the genuine intention, which actually the company's core business area meets with the social area of uh, challenges, then the project will be sustainable. And I think that, unfortunately, it can only be answered by the time. Thank you, Dr. Min. Maybe Madame Bukova wants to add. Just one word, because I think it's an important question. We should not uh, leave the audience misleadingly that uh, uh, governments are left aside. On the contrary, I think governments are the key. And uh, why they are the key? Because this sustainable development agenda is very different than the Millennium Development Goals. It is owned by the, by the countries and the governments uh, have, to be called, uh, 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 have to be held accountable uh, to its implementation. Uh, on the other side, it's a very much normative setting. And nowadays, and parliaments also play the crucial role, because if we want to achieve the sustainability framework, we have to have a new normative framework, new laws adopted by governments, uh, uh, take compulsory secondary education and primary. You have to have this. You have to allocate resources. Uh, so this is key. At the same time, precisely because they go so deeply into economy and society and environment, uh, it's a societal issue. It's an issue where private sector can bring investment in infrastructure, or in new technologies, innovation, uh, everything that is linked to, uh, uh, to the issue of, uh, of sustainability. And that is why we cannot dissociate what private sector is doing for sustainable development goals implementation uh, and, of course, the role of the government. So for the first time, I think it's a, it's a paradigm shift, as we say, in the having an ownership. It's into the normative setting, into the private sector and government uh, implementation into this. Uh, and, and this makes it complex, but also this makes the sustainability of all the efforts that are being taken. Thank you, Madam Bokoba. Uh, maybe final question from uh, the board member of the Ban Ki-moon Center from NGO Global Citizen. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Sheldrick, and I'm from uh, Global Citizen, which is an organization of about 24, 35 million, mostly millennials around the world, taking action. Um, I'm also an Australian citizen, and last month or last year, I was at a meeting actually, and I realized that Australia and Korea actually has quite a few things in common internationally. Both of us are perceived as middle powers, both of us are part of the G20 group in and we occupy this this group in called the MICTA, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey and, and Australia. And I, I'm just curious, particularly for the Korea, Korean members of the panel, um, in Australia over the years when we've often spoke about creative middle power diplomacy, you know, we under no illusions that we're a superpower, but we, we think we can sometimes make a difference. Sometimes we're, it, we're held back by what's been called a provincial reflex. Um, perhaps it's a legacy of our colonial past, I, I, I don't know. But I'm just curious, what, what is the view here around you know, Korea's ability to influence things on the world stage? And how do you take the public along with you to understand that what happens in our neighbor's backyard can affect us here? Maybe it's more relevant here, sometimes in Australia, 
with a big island border, it might be hard to make that case. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that question. But, uh, the Korea was instrumental in creating a uh, middle power group called MICTA. Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, Australia. And I think uh, maybe the right person to answer your question may be sitting right next to you, former foreign minister Kim Jong-un. <laughs> the microphone, please. Microphone. Uh, thank you, thank you for giving me a floor and opportunity to talk about how Korea can contribute to the world. Uh, actually, I was uh, working as the member of high-level panel while uh, we were making SDGs in the United Nations. So Korean, how Korea can contribute? Uh, at the time, I thought we should contribute more money and time and energy to the world affairs and global affairs. So at the time, Korea pledged to contribute more and spend more money for development assistance. But still, in the Korean society, we need to convince or persuade people why we should help people living in other countries. Because many people still think there are people in need in Korean society as well. So as uh, uh, Congressman Lee already mentioned, we need to persuade our constituency and the Korean people as well, the necessity to help other countries. So, I mean, as Korean economy made a progress, uh, Korea will make more contribution to the world and this kind of forum will provide many Koreans present here uh, why we should contribute in the world stage and for global affairs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Foreign uh, Minister Kim. <laughs> for answering a uh, surprise question. And uh, there, there is no free meeting to attend. <laughs> you have to always be prepared. And uh, before I give the floor to uh, those uh, uh, panelists who didn't uh, have time to uh, respond, maybe Zhang, Ed, or Alex, uh, give a final word, brief final word. John, you gonna go first or shall I? I, I just, um, you know, the, the tough thing here is, uh, where as, as a business person, we look at sustainability from the point of view that it makes enough profit for it to be repeated. There's a profit motive. Otherwise, it becomes philanthropic, and that really depends on who the CEO is at the time. Mm. And again, that's, that's, those are terms. Mm. Um, and so matching the profit motive, not the exorbitant profit motive, just a, a return, together with what governments do, mm. and they would like to work without a deficit, mm. but that doesn't necessarily happen very often. Mm. I think it's another one of the challenges which have to be, has to be reconciled in this new model. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I fully agree with you on the need to make it win-win proposition for all stakeholders. Professor So, you want to add something? Final word. Well, I would like to just uh, make a comment uh, following uh, your, I, I think basically, structurally, we are pro slowly building up um, some, some meaningful um, um, infrastructures. But I think um, more importantly, at the university level, we need to be aware that uh, to teach human beings we need ourselves to become human beings. And uh, this is what we um, lack so far um, in, in Korean education. We are so much geared toward information, getting knowledge, but we need to teach ourselves to be human. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Professor So. Ed? Ed? No? John? No, I mean, I want to to thank you as the moderator to have uh, given the opportunity of uh, sharing those uh, discussions. 
Uh, I want uh, also to take this opportunity to welcome Olympic uh, Winter Games in uh, Pyeongchang, and uh, I mean it's a unique uh, opportunity uh, to to link the celebration of the opening of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global uh, Citizens to be in a beautiful uh, country like uh, Korea, who have made so much development. I mean, Korea now is uh, one of the leaders in uh, motor industry, in um, electronic, and uh, I'm very happy also talking about road safety to see the progress uh, which uh, has been done, not enough, but still it is a problem which uh, has been addressed in uh, Korea, and uh, clearly the sport is consolidating the society, which is something uh, very encouraging, and uh, I hope we have a great uh, Olympic Games with a combination of North and South Korea. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we are very happy to end our panel discussion on that note. But before that, uh, also I must recognize one person, Professor Yang Su Gil, who has led uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network tirelessly, and uh, we must thank him for his efforts. So please, please stay the course and persist in your efforts. Any relevance for who? who, who? Uh. There was a North Korean soldier defector uh, which, who fled across the demilitarized zone line uh, in that area, and he was pursued by North Korean soldiers, and he was shot at. He sustained several bullets. He was taken to a hospital for emergency operation, and the medical team, when operating on him, was shocked to find. Mm that his stomach inside of the stomach was full of parasites, including one as long as two meters. And they also found several raw uh, corns, reflecting that North Korean soldiers were not being properly fed. So there are North Korean residents are living a, uh, a humanitarian hell. And then I've been, on behalf of Korean SDSN, I've been agonizing over the question of if there's anything that we can do with the SDG, SDGs in order to sort of help the North, North Korean residents. I have not been able to answer the question. Uh, I, I think it's a billion dollar question for all Koreans and uh, those who are here. And I, I, don't, I don't think uh, maybe uh, one minute, uh, two minute answer uh, will satisfy. So maybe we need uh, to have another session planned uh, to discuss it. But I know from my experience they are in dire need of SDG, and they were the part of uh, SDG agenda uh, in 2015, and they were the, one of the first who ratified the Paris Agreement, for example, on climate change. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, end our panel discussion, and I must thank all the panelists, first of all, for being very precise to the point, <laughs> and time management was my uh, most difficult uh, headache, but I think uh, we successfully managed it. Please give all of our panelists a big applause. So now, the uh, session has ended. Uh, while uh, panelists uh, go down uh, to the first row, we have to clear the stage for the next session because of the time constraints. Next session will go on without break. So please stay in your seats while we are preparing a new uh, stage preparation and